Hello and welcome back to chapter 15 in Healthcare Law and Ethics. We are picking up with section 2 over on 347. Now again, this is going to be very abbreviated, probably even more abbreviated than section 1 because we're not going to cover all of the paragraphs and all of the sections within this section. So in this section, we're actually getting into types of sensitive health information. You see on our slide here, we're going to talk about behavioral, we're going to talk about substance abuse, we're going to skip a little bit about AIDS. We'll talk a little bit, just a little bit about genetic, and then we'll talk about some adoption information. Now, again, um, I'm not going to read all of this. So, one thing just to remember, talk about, you know, read through the section about behavioral health, how it encompasses the treatment of mental disorders and intellectual and developmental disabilities. And remember, we've talked about this a couple of times now, that psychotherapy notes are kept separate from that legal record. And they are not included and they are not released. So again, read through that. Over on 348, continuing on um, behavioral health, we still are talking about how um, uh, healthcare providers, because of the sensitive nature, you know, we don't necessarily release information in behavioral health. HIPAA doesn't specifically talk about behavioral health records, so you kind of have to look at your state laws. One thing I want you to pay attention to is your privilege statutes, okay? Privilege statutes say that there are confidential communications between a provider and a patient, and they're legally protected, especially related to diagnosis and treatment from disclosure during civil and some criminal misdemeanor litigation. Now, there are some exceptions to that, if the patient brings up their mental health condition or their emotional condition, then it's fair game. Or if the health professional performs an exam under a court order, that's fair game. And if a psychiatrist in an involuntary commitment procedure recommends admission and confinement of the patient to avoid harm to the patient or to others, then that's going to be fair game as well. Now, let's talk about duty to warn. Okay, duty to warn basically says that state law is going to permit or even compel. That means it's, they're going to they're being pushed to do it for the safety of the uh, subject. Okay, so if I go to a counselor and I tell them, you know, I'm really tired of my husband, and I, I just I think I'm going to kill him today. I, I just I feel the need. To murder my husband today it's gonna happen today so under duty to warn that psychologist or psychiatrist or counselor or whoever that I'm talking to they are permitted to get in contact with my husband or even law enforcement to say hey my patient today said she was gonna go home and murder her husband um, we need to do something about this you need to either go protect him or watch her or something but that's what duty to warn is now, it mentions Tarasov versus the Regents of the University of California. Just to get an example of what duty to warn actually means, I want you to read that. It's toward the bottom of page 348. But basically, a therapist had a patient tell them that they were going to kill their girlfriend. And they ended up killing their girlfriend. But the therapist didn't warn anyone. And so, that's where this lawsuit comes into place. Um, and that's where kind of the duty to warn... Um, kind of comes out and you know you you, you don't want to be caught in that situation to where you think oh well they're just talking they're not really going to do anything you've got to you know use your best judgment and ensure that you are protecting those that need protecting all right moving over to substance abuse again super super abbreviated here so again you have special privacy protection given to patients that are receiving treatment for substance abuse that's going to include alcohol and drugs we've talked about a couple of these laws um, from 1987 we had the confidentiality confidentiality of alcohol and drug abuse patient records regulation we also have um, the drug abuse prevention treatment and rehab act of 1972 and so you can continue to read on about the special um, access and disclosure procedures that have to be followed for those programs um, you can see exactly what an authorization for disclosure of release of information from a substance abuse facility should include. It's over on page 350. So um, you can read through that, see what's going on there. 
Um, over on 352, we're going to kind of get just a tiny little bit into the um, HIV and AIDS. So, healthcare organizations have to comply with applicable state laws to protect the privacy and confidentiality with patients that have HIV or AIDS. Also, sexually transmitted diseases and in viral hepatitis or other communicable diseases. So, this is where our communicable diseases comes into play as well. So, state law require physicians, clinics, hospitals, labs, penal institutions, and others who identify a patient with a diagnosis of HIV, AIDS, or certain STDs and other infectious diagnoses to report these diagnoses to the State Department of Health and other appropriate agency. Now, um, you can read through the rest of this if you would like, but we're going to stop at that section. Um, not really looking a lot into the confidentiality protection of AIDS, not looking at criminal liability to related to HIV, um, not getting into the mandatory HIV testing. Um, so we're going to finish up this section today, um, and we're going to pick up with um, genetic information um, tomorrow. But um, you can read through that first section about AIDS. Um, we'll cover just a sentence or two about the genetic information. I didn't actually include it in our slides, but we'll, um, we'll get with that when we get to section three. And then we're mostly going to talk about adoption um, there. All right, so let's look at the first four under Check Your Understanding on uh, page 354. So number one, HIPAA does distinguish highly sensitive health information from other types of health information. That is false. They do not. HIPAA is a floor, remember? So it's just, uh, it, it talks about all information as being the same. So you have to count on state laws to kind of protect those sensitive areas. Number two, psychotherapy notes are always a part of the behavioral health record. That's false. We've talked about this multiple times now. Psychotherapy notes are separated. They're not part of that health record. Number three, the duty to warn obligation enables a physician to disclose information to a third party who may be the victim of harm perpetrated by a patient. That's true. So, again, if I go to my psychiatrist and I say, man, that husband, he's, 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 He's reached the, the, the length of his rope. I'm going to go home and I'm going to stab him until he's dead. Then they can reach out to that husband and they can say, your wife said she's going to harm you. Be on guard. And number four, for a substance abuse program to be in compliance with the privacy rule, the authorization of disclosure of information should include specific elements required by the privacy rule. And that's true. That's what we um, I just told you to pay attention to over on page 350. There's certain information that has to be included when we're talking about substance abuse. Okay. All right. So we will pick up with section three. Again, we'll touch briefly on genetic information. And then we're going to talk mostly about adoption. So it's going to be another super short section. And then we'll finish up with uh, sections four and five. So happy reading and happy studying.